And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the Astraya campaign set campaign setting for D&D 5th edition, and a, man, and a man who is who is self-proclaimed just a fat yeti. Sorry, Tony Shivani, you're never living that down. The one, the one and only Richard Davis. How you doing today, man? Very, very well. Thank you for having me here. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so I tend to start with the humble beginnings, as it were. With that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? So, I'm fairly new to everything role-playing. Um, uh, at university, we have a society, so like a club for role-playing games, um, mm -hmm. and that's how I kind of got introduced to it, because a friend of mine took me to their induction evening, where it's just like, have a play of this, have a play of that, and yeah, uh, kind of fell in love from there. Um, the first campaign I played was Pathfinder, First Ed, mm -hmm. um, and it was tremendous fun and i think it really kind of um showed me what the power of a good dm can do because uh his name was jr but he was fantastic and i was in awe of him and the game from day one really um and yeah since then it was a lot of pathfinder a lot of fifth ed um as a lot of people get into uh role-playing games and then from there i've tried to branch out and play and explore a lot more uh, indie games and smaller TTRPGs and creations mm -hmm. and had a lot of fun in the process. Now, when it comes to Astraya, um, what was, was, was that born of just the camp, just the campaigns that you were playing and, ru and running at the time? Or how did the idea to start doing your own campaign setting come about? Um, Basically, I a lot of my friends enjoyed Fifth Ed. I'm like I, I think that's the case with a lot of people where you come across a really cool game and you want to play it, but you can't necessarily find enough people who want to play it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my friends had played a lot of Fifth Ed. They were used to Fifth Ed. They liked Fifth Ed. They wanted to play Fifth Ed, um, and so I what I ended up kind of as the default DM in. <laughs> A group of friends and i don't mind it i like dming i like the challenges it, it it poses i don't pretend i'm particularly great at it but i like the creative aspect of it mm -hmm. um and instead of having to try and play catch up with some of my friends who have been playing role-playing games and D, D specifically for like decades at this point um i thought it best just to make my own setting um that way it's a case of well no i know i'm right because i made it rather than missing a piece of law and having conflicts of understanding of established um histories and law and everything so yeah i just yeah i think uh Australia was my second attempt at a homebrew uh the first one was okay but looking back at it certainly a little more disjointed um and yeah it kind of started as a homebrew and grew and grew and grew really mm -hmm. and when it com when it when it comes to when it comes to it as as it being your being your um second was the fir was the first one just a case of it developed into a bit and then can and then kind of reached a dead end yeah so the first one i called arden um i was trying to I, I really like the concept behind it which was that um it's this new world and this god has gone into other universes and other worlds and cherry-picked and placed all the different races and animals into this world to try and populate it so it's the creation of this new world um but it was this kind of weird marriage of existing law because obviously these peoples and creatures and beasts have their own histories and their own worlds and their own established law which was trying to kind of tap into what um was already established in D D, and then like their own culture that they have since established in this new world and it was a really interesting concept and we really enjoyed playing it um but i just it didn't really i don't know i didn't really enjoy it as much as i thought i would 
Um, and everything that I then ended up trying to change about it eventually grew into Australia. Mm-hmm. Now, the when I looked at Australia's um, setup, mm-hmm. correct me if I'm correct me if I'm wrong on this, but were you trying to aim for a more low fantasy end of things? The main yeah. reason that I asked that is because of the fact that. Um, character creation as it currently stands is only 10 class is only 10 levels long for each class yeah um i my favorite book series as a child and like even to this day really is um the belgariad series by david eddings Mm -hmm. um kind of i won't say high fantasy but it has like three wizards in it and that's it and they have gone down in uh gone down in the uh history books for millennia and so it's kind of this low fantasy setting with high fantasy stuff happening in it and i quite liked that um i've played in several campaigns that are much more high fantasy and much more much more highly magical and whilst i've enjoyed them um i'm an engineering student so i always want the specifics of stuff i remember this one time i was um in a friend's larp and i asked him what the tensile strength of a material was because i was going to do the maths to say no i can do and it was just a mess <laughs> um yeah I, I like high magic settings but for me they just i always kind of go down the avenue of well if i can do that i should be able to do this and well, you could use that to do this. And if you have a good DM to engage you, it's really, really great. But sometimes you just end up going down the rabbit hole too far. Um, I remember a friend of mine showing me Simba Room Mm -hmm. and just being completely enamored by it. It is such a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, Mm -hmm. But I also really (laughs) liked the idea that the explored portion of the map is so tiny um (laughs) and so yeah australia is kind of my imagining of simba room using fifth ed in a weird way but yeah um i think also the fact that in australia my setting um all magic has a physical cost through mana Mm -hmm. um means that you can't just be flinging off spells as you wish or anything like that you have to do the prep work you have to be prepared Mm -hmm. otherwise you're not in for a good time and that's what i always enjoyed about role-playing games is being presented with a a problem and working with the party to come up with inventive solutions to it um and feeling prepared when going into those solutions and then into those situations and then having the kind of carpet ripped out from underneath you almost would it be fair of me to say that um, when it came to when it, that initi- that in your initial draft of the of the game you had planned for a you had planned to use the co- the core classes within D anD D, but as you developed it, it uh, it was clear that that wasn't going to work, or did you have no plans to use the core classes at any point? I a bit of both, so. I I knew I wanted new classes, but I didn't have any problems kind of borrowing from the existing ones. Um, So Wildman, for instance, is very much kind of a rogue. They have the exact same sneak attack mechanic. Um, And you can certainly see the influences of other classes in D&D on the classes in Australia. Um, Yeah, uh, I, I was definitely aiming for something different. But certainly, I wasn't trying to hide the inspirations behind them. Mm-hmm. Um, and given what given what you mentioned about um, about tw- about spell about spells, what I'm guess I'm guessing that one that you did not want to use the um, Vancian model that's u- that's used in D and D at any point. Not really. So spellcasting in Australia is quite weird. <laughs> so, uh, there are three main ways in which you can do it. Um, one is through Dwarven Runes, which is essentially enchanting items and armor. Um, the other is Elven Rituals, which are... how to put it? Um, it's almost like performing a seance. Like You have to kind of set everything out, be a, like peace of mind have all of your prep done and then you have an effect that happens 
Um, but you can also use some elven rituals to set in place traps and stuff like that. So I did a campaign where they had to hunt down, uh, like, uh, what was it? Um, oh, they had to withstand a marrow attack on this small island, and they just started digging trenches and pitfall traps with, with their wildmen. They started laying down other various traps and spells with um, their enchanter for yeah by using elven rituals, and it was not great for the marrow <laughs> because they'd prepared well like that it was just a bloodbath mm -hmm. um the other way that you can use magic is through thaumaturgy so basically an alchemist um that one's probably the closest to what most people would recognize as spell casting i feel because a lot of the effects are more instantaneous um, but again you still have to do the preparation you still have to make the potions and everything And when it com when it comes to when it comes now when it comes when it comes to the the particular setup within um within within these within the spell within the spell within the spell casting um that you have would it be fair of me to say that somebody who in the past had um abu had abused fireball or the like is gonna is gonna have to do a whole lot of um prep just to get just to get their fireball spell or is or is that sort of casual magic just not going to be feasible in the setting um, I, I think casual magic's not particularly super feasible like the i what i try to achieve with this is that if you run into an encounter without any thought you're not going to be in for a good time mm -hmm. um preparation is key but you can prepare for the unexpected in a way so mm -hmm. making sure that you have brewed all the potions that you need um in all for your thaumaturgist and his spells to make sure that you have all the components you need for your elven rituals um to try and get as many pieces of armor and weaponry enchanted with dwarven runes ahead of time um things like that can really really help you um i that being said, though, how to put it? Um, the reason it only goes up to 10th level is because I don't like how silly D&D can get at super, super high levels. Um, it's a lot of fun, don't get me wrong, but sometimes it's just a bit too much for my personal tastes. And Australia is a selfish endeavour. It's just something that I made because I enjoy running it, I enjoy playing it. Mm -hmm. Um but that being said, I was helping a friend of mine gen his character because I'm starting a new campaign for Australia. And he's gone as a knight and a carrying a Gygus hammer because I love Gygus hammers, they're great. Um, but it means that I think his maximum capable damage output, like if he rolled a nat 20 and top dice on everything, is in the mid 80s at level 4. It's just ridiculous um, but that's everything going his way and that's being super specific so i don't mind the ridiculous happening as much i just want people to work for it and to prepare for it or specialize in it um and yeah that's what i've tried to do with this i don't know how well i've done it but yeah mm -hmm. and taking now taking that into taking that into account um now, I, re I realize that Australia is very is a very much in flux um, project, but has th has there been consideration as far as put as far as putting in some sort of conversion guide, um, so pe so people could know what um, particular archetypes and the like would be feasible to add into Australia and which ones would be less so. That's a really really good question. Um... I haven't given it much previous thought, but I don't think it would be too difficult because it is based off the system reference document. Mm -hmm. um, the, my main concern would be the um, magic uses, again, because of the physical cost of mana, but because I've already got magic classes such as the Enchanter and the Wildman and Smith can also use magic to some extent, um, I don't think it'd be outside of the realms of possibility. That'd be quite interesting to do. Mm 
<laughs> now, when it now when it comes to when it comes to now when it comes to the um, the set the setting within. Um, now we are we already had established that you're go, that you're going for a more um, low low fantasy more more high more high medieval ap approach. Um, yeah. I'm trying not I'm trying not to make a game not to make a Game of Thrones comparison because I don't think you're going to be dealing with as many severed heads. Um, but would it be would it be fair to say that lower fantasy approaches like Game of Thrones or The Witcher would be um, would be the kind of fantasy that you that you want to shoot for with this setting? Um, in the campaigns that I run with it, certainly, like The Witcher was a big inspiration. Simbaroom, kind of. Um, the idea is that Australia is a very young kingdom set up after a civil war kind of wrecked the old kingdom of Sunder, mm -hmm. um, and so they've fled across an ocean and set this one up and it's set in this young kingdom about a hundred years later mm -hmm. um, and they're surrounded by the great forest the uplands which are this great mountainous range and then the sands which is this massive desert and so the idea is to try and go into these areas of wilderness and hunt down big bad beasties and um try and drain their blood for mana i should have mentioned you get mana by draining the blood of big bad magical beasties mm -hmm. but yeah um <laughs> Yeah, so like kind of The Witcher and Simbaroon were big inspirations for this. However, that being said, um, less so with Australia, but with my with some of the other smaller projects I've worked on, I really like creating a system and trying to leave the setting a little more ambiguous for people to adapt and use as they wish. Um, Australia does have like a little bit of lore attached to it, but um, I've got notebooks full of uh, um, kind of the details of the campaigns that I've run and people and encounters and factions and stuff like that that I haven't included quite deliberately because I want people to kind of see Australia as a blank canvas. It is this young kingdom. It's still sorting itself out. It's still got growing pains. It doesn't have all the answers. And I think it's quite interesting for a DM and the players to kind of explore that together and help create the world that they want to explore together. And so I think I've kind of given them the skeleton for that, but to flesh it out a bit more, they can do so themselves. Which makes sense. Um, yeah. When, now, when it comes to... when um, One of the things that immediately struck me early on when I, when I looked into the, the, um, the system was the CMS, the Crown Military Services. And... I'm curious, given the given the way that they're described as the as the main peacekeeping force, um, what, both being a standard army and a um and a poli and a police force, um, as well as well as other matters, would would it be say would it be fair to say that you've kind of put in a soft earmark that peace that a um easy setup for player characters is to be members of the CMS. Yeah. Um. I had uh, one of my campaigns began with the player party essentially being press ganged into the CMS, um, which was quite good. Um, it was on the premise that they had done enough notable acts that they were believed to be competent, but the CMS needed to carry out a mission that they couldn't be seen attached to. So it's like, cool, so you're going to work for us, but if anyone asks, you do not work for us. No, you don't have a choice in this. Um, but no, the CMS is supposed to be um, this kind of conglomerate, um, this, uh, as you say, like a standing army, essentially, mm -hmm. that acts as militia, police force, army if necessary, just the military as a whole. Um, again, I've left it deliberately vague, that way people can flavour it as they wish. Um, when I ran it, I had like different divisions within it. Um, some people may just want it as this huge organization. Some people may want to really heavily attach it to the monarchy and say, like, they directly report to the um, to the monarch. Some people may want to say, no, it's this. It was sanctioned by them, but they operate independently. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, again, kind of left deliberately vague, but kind of a hint and a nudge in the direction that I imagined it to go in. Which I can de I can definitely um. I can definitely get that. Um, also, the, also there's the there's the fact that, given how elves are 
are described are described as um an unco a uncommon sight and dwar and um dw and dwarves are highly isolationist would it also be fair to say that you're aiming for a very hu human centric kind of campaign where yeah. it's um, possible for someone to play as a non-human but there's going to be baggage associated with it yeah um so i've always had it that way in my campaigns it's human only but i want to try and explore the idea of introducing additional races um specifically the elves the dwarves and the galesh um the galesh are this homebrew race of um essentially scorpion centaur kind of people down in the desert um if you ever watched i can't remember which one it was but it was in the mummy franchise with brendan fraser they had a like um the baddie in that kind of turn into half uh, scorpion oh, yeah. half oh, yeah. man the, the scorpion king yeah yeah um that that kind of he was basically the direct inspiration for them but yeah <laughs> um I, I i think it would be really interesting as a campaign i did to kind of run something like that because um again like the premise is that australia has now established itself and now a century on it's looking to expand and that's why it's pushing into these areas and so having this increased interaction with the people that live there would be really interesting which i can i can definitely i, I can definitely get that um given that given that um you tr that a large focus is going to be on a hum on a human centric campaign is is that one of the main reasons why you put in the um upbringing um system in there um Yes and no, like I, hmm. I, I, I can't really remember, I'll be honest, I can't really remember how I came about the upbringing system, but I quite liked it once I sorted it out. Um, so the idea is that there's this table of um, 39, um, 39, yes, 39 uh, proficient uh, occupations that your parents could have, and you roll 2d20 on the table twice, and you basically get the occupations of your two parents and each parent gives you two proficiencies um and then the last two proficiencies you choose from your class mm -hmm. um i i think it's because i have a several friends that really enjoy um kind of getting into the nitty-gritty of the mechanics and the numbers of role-playing games um like they know shadow run like the back of their hands um and min maxing to the fullest extent and everything like that and so for them they can i've always been happy with them picking their two parents um and having the two uh, the two proficiencies that they choose from their class but then i've also had players and people who i've played with who really like the random na random nature of role-playing games and they'll roll for their health and they'll roll for everything and they're happy with whatever because they that's what they enjoy about the game and so i thought the occupations thing was a way of how you can just expand on that for your character's concept and background and everything mm -hmm. um, and by having some useful proficiencies attached to perhaps at first glance not useful occupations it allows you to have a character that's still very good at what they do but you can kind of create this character background that's not as stereotypical if that makes sense yeah i i, I can i can see re, i can see where you're going with that yeah now when it comes now when it comes to when it, com when, it, when it comes to the set when it comes to the setup that you have um I'm cu something I'm cu something I'm curious ab about is what's is what sort of campaign styles do you think your game would lean towards? So I've tried deliberately to run a few different style or rather campaigns with different objectives mm -hmm. uh, and testing it. So I have run a inner city kind of gang intrigue campaign in the capital 
I have run several campaigns where people are going out into the Great Forest or the uplands or the sands to try and explore. Um, some of the ones that I've been most successful with are the ones where they have essentially a hunt because, again, mana is the most valuable resource in the game and you get it from the blood of magical monsters. You hunt them. Um, I did. Uh, I was really happy with the campaign that... Uh, was hunting a dragon turtle because it was all of these people who are like yeah we can't wait to go into this great forest we can't go wait to go here and i was just like so you're going to the sea um, <laughs> uh, but they did really well uh, they had a wildman that had um, a focus on trapping and the look on his face as he realized how the hell do i trap something at sea but then seeing them work together to try and figure out how they can use everyone's skills effectively was what i really enjoy and um, they ended up trying to um, essentially bait the dragon turtle onto this small island and then blowing it apart with explosives and it worked to very great effect um but yeah like i've done inner city kind of gang intrigue as i say hunts ex more exploratory stuff um i want to do more in the uplands i feel um just because i want to in my own kind of head canon uh establish a bit more with the dwarves um mm -hmm. But yeah, I've I've tried to do a bit of everything. Um, now take taking that taking that into account, would you? When I look at the map, one thing I'm curious about is: Do you think that this is a kind of game that would um would lend itself to a more hex crawl style of sandbox play? Ooh. Uh -huh. I've never played too many kind of hex cruel games, being honest. So mm -hmm. I don't really think I can answer the question one way or another. I'd be really interested to see people try and tell me of their experiences and everything. Um, but yeah, I could see something like that potentially working. Oh. Um, I, <laughs> I'll be honest, I did have a continent map as well at, in an earlier revision. Um, I don't think it's in that one, no. Uh, however, I commissioned um, the very wonderful Jason, who did the artwork for this map that you can see. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm really happy with it. He did a great, great job. Um, and I'm hoping at some point to hopefully commission him again to do the continent map. Um, but the focus has always been on Australia as a kingdom, exploring the unknown around it, not traveling several thousand miles away. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Give, um, given given that given that have you d have most of your campaigns when you've done when you've done Australia yourself have they have they focused on a give have they focused on exploring a given region or have they um, have they focused on staying put within a particular um, city or se or settlement or what have you. Um. Over the course of the various campaigns I've run, we've gone to each of the towns and cities that you can see on the map. Mm -hmm. um, the one that I've probably revisited the most is Axstead, um, just because one of my campaigns, um, they set up a mana trading company in Axstead to mm -hmm. great effect, where they would go off into the Great Forest, um, kill big beasties, and float them down on rafts back down to Axstead to be processed um and then trade throughout the rest of australia and they made so much silver it was ridiculous um and because they spent so much time there we kind of established more kind of canon within the confines of our campaign and i ended up making a couple of small maps for the area and stuff like that mm -hmm. that um i think i've just felt more comfortable uh dming around that area as a result um but i've dm'd as I say, for each of the locations on the map, and I've got a bit of an idea of what I want to do with each of them. But I, did, I again, haven't put that in the book because I want people to create a world with their players. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So with that in mind, would you say that one of your goals with Astray is to create a um, more more a set of bullet points than ra than rather a hard and fast um, yeah. set up set up for how the world is how the setting works? Yeah. So. Um, I never put Australia on itch for 
other people to play really i put it there that way i could direct my players to it um but it got a fair little bit of attention and i put up a couple of posts on reddit and whatnot and people seemed to enjoy it and that was really encouraging um but it is foremost and always will be just basically a homebrew for me and my friends to play and mess around in um and so it, it sounds selfish but i don't really feel obligated to develop it super super far for the sake of everyone else um there is still work that i want to do to it and i will do to it um in order to improve the quality of it um i need to add more entries into the beastry i need to take another look at how botany works i've seen a couple of areas in how the classes work that i want to readdress um but yeah um I, as i said like I, I i like games where they kind of give you the um the system and maybe some bullet points on here's what this is here's what that is kind of thing and then you can kind of explore the gray space with your dm and mm -hmm. the other players and that's what i kind of wanted to provide with this yeah um one now one of the things given the fact given the fact that um there are that for say knights there's the whole idea of knightly orders have you put it have you put consideration into not go not going into excessive detail on, on it but um just, but going into kind of example ideas of what a knightly order in the setting might look like that's fair um i hadn't really considered it until now but that's just because i don't think i'd thought of it though i like the idea of providing examples um such that way people can see what i'm trying to achieve but don't necessarily have to follow that example if that makes sense with the law mm -hmm. attached to it um the four uh, like the three orders that are currently there are court knights so they work in service of the monarchy church knights who work in service of the church and hedge knights who work for themselves basically yeah. um and i kind of like that um again in, i've got a lot of head canon or canon that's kind of been established with me and my friends and the other players and everything um the idea was that because the church in the old kingdom helped the monarchy escape they were granted extra powers in australia however they've started to abuse them a little bit and it's led to tensions um, and hence why the church feels as though they need their own knights for their protection for their assets and properties and missions and everything like that. Um, a campaign idea I did have at one point was um, essentially a church missionary trying to go in and convert the elves, uh, <laughs> which would have been interesting. I can't remember why we abandoned that, actually. Need to revisit it. But yeah, uh, <laughs> no, I... Sorry, I keep deviating. <laughs> I... I like the idea of dropping in nuggets of information of the law that I have established in the form of examples. And it's something that, in all honesty, I'm probably going to end up doing. Um, I, because of COVID and everything, a lot of my campaigns and my, a lot of my plans for campaigns dropped off. Mm -hmm. um, however, I have just set up a new campaign online that should be starting soon. And I'm hoping that when that starts ramping up a bit more um it'll essentially be another load of beta testers essentially um pointing out spelling mistakes pointing out errors pointing out oh you have you considered doing this and me just furiously taking down notes whilst trying to run a campaign on the side um, but yeah i'm looking forward to it now when it cut now um how now You've had you've had the Astraea setting around for around for a while, both both in your own work and on um, itch. Um, what would you say, what would you say were some of the big takeaways that you ended up learning from just getting feedback on it? Um, I think if you're looking to try and, I think Australia's main problem is that it's in this kind of grey area so it's it's essentially a homebrew for 5th ed however it's got some mechanics changed it's got enough in there that's a little bit different that's kind of grown into its own thing so trying to explain to people 
it's kind of like fifth ed it's not really fifth ed um can sometimes be a little bit off-putting and having a what is it a 66 page document as it currently stands plus other supplementary materials is a little intense to throw at someone to take a look at um something that i had recommended to me and i really quite liked was essentially just building a character so template characters um and showing those to people so like this is the kind of thing that you can do um so this is who joe blogs he is a knight he does this um and i've used that to uh quite good effect but in the past um again with the society university we have these pitch evenings where you have to pitch your game and then people come up and say that they would like to play it um and whatnot and yeah i believe i did something to that effect for that and it seems to work quite well so yeah i think my main takeaways are try and make your itch page look pretty i need to do a bit of work for the australia one at the moment but it'll get there um try and have an elevator pitch for what it is that way you don't have as i say a 66 page document that people have to read all the way through to try and understand what it is you're doing um and yeah be passionate about it really like mm -hmm. i i really like australia um i don't think it's the greatest thing in the world but i'm really proud of it i've had a lot of fun making it and i have even more fun running it and that's what you want from a game really yeah. and this is this is the sort of thing that now for, fortunately throughout the history of role playing games there have always been this this sort of um story of a game that ended up evolving from a bunch of people just sitting together, not knowing what they what exactly they were doing. Um, as I often said, the greatest innovations were done by people who didn't have a clue. Absolutely. And taking that taking that taking that into account, um, do you do you see the, do you see the um, f the future of Australia kind of vent kind of venturing further into further into its own thing where it ends up feeling less like a campaign setting of 5e and more like a 5e hack uh it's definitely what i've been trying to lean towards a bit so um i've introduced a couple new mechanics um so uh there are mechanics in place for uh the way that alchemy works in it the way that each the other magic systems work in it the way that uh, there's a mechanic in place for how you go about draining the blood from the magical beasts and how all of that side of it works um there's a flanking mechanic because it was a homebrew rule that me and my friends always used when we were playing fifth ed anyway so we decided just to throw it in there <laughs> um so i've started to try and make it diverge away from just a fifth ed um not expansion but setting um and I'm certainly hoping to take it even further into its own identity. Um, yeah, that's certainly the intent. Yeah, and take and taking that taking that into taking that into account. Um, like I I know th I know that um, you're probably go you're probably going to maintain that whole um, tenth level ca tenth level cap, but. Have has there been has there been thought given towards um, towards bring towards bringing in certain older mechanics that have been forgotten by the by the core um, end of the end of D and D, especially when it comes to the idea of some of somebody own somebody um, potentially being a lord, since that was a big thing in the old days of the of D and D. Of once you reached a certain level, you were a lord, you gained followers, and so on be honest i'm not that overly familiar with older editions of DD since i learned on fit <laughs> um, yeah. the advice of most of my friends was the older editions are cool but if you're used to fifth stick with fifth because oh. it can be difficult to play some of the older ones um and since then i've kind of gone off and started playing a lot of other indie indie stuff anyway but i really i i, I do agree that at the moment australia is almost a little limited in its scope um a tenth level level cap means that you don't really have room that much room for a long form campaign um or if you do you really have to kind of stretch out those level ups um i i think that the idea of becoming a lord or becoming a notable within the setting itself is a really quite elegant way of going about that and it's certainly something that i'm definitely going to look into now yeah. um for what it's worth and for what it's worth maybe look into 
And I'm and in the interest of disclosure, I will note that the creator of this is a friend of mine. Look into Adventure Conqueror King system, which is a hack of old, of older ones, but it does expand on that whole end game um, concept. Um, That's pretty cool. And I know when when it comes to what you, what people have told you about about um about getting into the old ones. That's technically correct, but I would disagree on the notion of just be that there's still I think there's still ideas that can be taken from from older games and you and used as inspiration for um current day products. Like I I don't like the idea of ju of just turn of just turning away from the, from no, the whole thing. I think it was more the fact that um how to put it. I've played Pathfinder, mm -hmm. which is very similar to three and three point five, from my understanding. Yes. Um, and I've played a lot of fifth. Um, the consensus among a lot of my friends was that fourth edition D and D was not that great, and I I don't think it's that I trust their. It's not that I trust or distrust their opinion on whether or not it's good. It's just that knowing that the people that I typically play with don't really have an interest in playing it has meant that I haven't necessarily had the opportunity to play it or the interest in learning how to play it because I know that they wouldn't want to play it with me. <laughs> um, um, that being said, I, I have started looking at um, a lot of the old school essentials and um, that kind of stuff where they are much more based on the older versions of D&D &D or take a heavy influence from the older versions of D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been quite and uh, that's been really interesting and something that I'm hoping to do more of. Um, but yeah. And when now obvious, obviously replicating some of the, some of the old mechanics, I wouldn't recommend. I sur I sure as hell wouldn't recommend bringing back Thaco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've had a couple of friends try and explain exactly how that works to me in the past. And it just I like the mechanics of a lot of games, but that one just seemed far too convoluted even for me. Um, but yeah, yeah. But one, I will, I will admit that one thing I was, one thing I was curious about because this is a um, a concept that's oh, that's been a bit, uh, it's been a bit of a um, what I like to call a scub moment when it comes to fifth edition's design and that is the placement of feats now obviously in fifth edition core feats were a um alternative version to ability score improvement but were feats something that ever came up a a significant amount during your during your campaigns or was it just not really a thing that was discussed um, when i've played fifth ed with friends before um I've typically gone after feats. I quite like what they do. Mm -hmm. um, however, they've always seemed to... Not necessarily force, but kind of... Once you kind of take a feat for a specific kind of play style, you almost feel obligated to go play that play style, if that makes sense. Um, I, I I never really put feats in Australia just because I liked the open-endedness of it. Um, also, I'll be honest, it saved me a whole load of work not having to come up with new feats for the, all these new different classes and everything. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I again, I speak from a place of ignorance because I haven't played earlier versions of D&D, &D, but I think in 5th edition that feats are a really useful feature that I do use a lot as a player when I'm playing fifth ed. Um, it's just something that I never really felt the need to include in Australia as much. Mm -hmm. Well, in my experience, when it comes when it comes to first off, feats aren't ex aren't exactly as old of old of a concept as you might think. Um, in fact, they re they really started with their, with um they kind they kind of. Backdoor piloted their way in with um, advanced second, but they didn't really show up until third, and then of course Pathfinder, yeah, um, which has far too many. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, it do it does. I just I just think that fifth edition's take on feats is um, swinging the pendulum too far the other way. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, 
Yeah. Um, I mean, it's difficult. Um, you, I mean, this may be simplifying it, but you do run the risk of narrowing down people's choices too much and not giving them enough choice, as yeah. some people may argue with fifth ed because there aren't that that many feats. Um, but then you look at games like Shadowrun fifth ed or all of the feats and character gen in Pathfinder, and it's useful that you can pretty much accomplish any character concept that you have or could ever want because they have a mechanic or they have a build for that but it can be really intimidating for newer players and i feel as though i'm playing in a fifth edition campaign uh, sorry i'm playing in a shadow run fifth edition campaign at the moment mm -hmm. and i really like it but it's the first time tell the lights the second time but the first campaign cut short it's the second time i've ever played Shadowrun fifth ed and i really really enjoy it but it's myself and a couple of others it's the first time we've really kind of got our teeth into it and we're there with five pdfs open swapping back and forth between them trying to remember which page our stuff's on and whilst i enjoy the character concept i've made and had a real sense of satisfaction um realizing that concept sometimes and it could it, i i imagine it's just because i'm inexperienced with the mm -hmm. system and it takes more getting used to but flicking through pdfs and trying to find what it is i need isn't always th my idea of fun um the dm is fantastic however like dan if you're listening i love you but yeah <laughs> uh yeah it, it, it's a lot of fun but it does risk it does run the risk of being a little overbearing sometimes i feel yeah and when it com when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to those sort those that's those sort of concept stuff when it especially with something like shadowrun um some yeah there is that there is definitely two ends of the, two ends of that extreme shadowrun's always been one that has been that has been on the very crunchy end of things whereas some games are less so um i do think that there's room for a middle gr for a middle ground instead of having to go through two very distinct extremes on the on the equation yeah um i, I mean it also i think comes down to personal taste like i know some people who love shadow run with a passion it's all they run because they know it inside backwards upside down every which way um, and I know some people who only play fifth ed because they find like three or three point five too intimidating a game to play almost. Um, you can't really make a game that appeals to every potential player, I believe. Um, Honestly, and so you shouldn't. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I I think that's why I've put in as much effort into Australia as I have is because I'm not trying to appeal to any other players. It's purely selfish as i said i'm making what i enjoy to run and what i enjoy to play um and yeah having a bit of a blast doing so mm -hmm. and when it comes when it comes to now grant now granted in my experience i found um 13th age to be an interesting middle ground but that but that's just me um the other thing, the other, the other thing is, when it cut when, when it came to when it came to the archetypes, um, for each of the classes, did you have it in mind that you were go that you're going to have, at least two archetypes for each and have and, ha and have them with um three, benefits each. Yeah. So um, I kind of came up with the template of the levels. Um uh so where how to put it so every class gets the archetype feature at third sixth and ninth um every class gets the ability score improvement at fourth and eighth um i kind of came up with that template of okay so i need to put in skills to fill here 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 and here um and it seemed to work it was perhaps a bit not cheap but a little fast but it meant that it was a quite easy way to try and balance the classes that way no nothing was super overpowered early on or over like overpowered later on or whatever um certainly the intent was at first to 
get a usable document where people had the bare minimum of choice of two archetypes. I've got a couple of concepts that I need to flesh out a bit more for other archetypes. My hope is to eventually have it up to maybe like three, maybe even four archetypes for each class and maybe even introduce late other classes later down the line. Um, but at the moment, I'm focusing on trying to flesh out the other mechanics. As I said, I need to revisit the... Um, it's called the Book of Botany, but basically the plants and herbs and everything that exist in the setting, because they can be used in potions and spells and all of that stuff. Um, I need to revisit that and the mechanics of how that works. I want to add more to the beast tree because at the moment it's a little bit limited. Um, and yeah, kind of expand on perhaps other mechanics and the core documentation as such by itself also. Yeah, I can get, I can definitely get that. Um, now, when it came when when it came to when it came to designing the the um, classes, were there were there um, was it a was it a case where you had where you had set up a a short list of concepts and then built classes around it, or look or did you ever look at any of the core classes and go, okay, which okay, which ones of these can I keep and which ones am I gonna have to blow up? It, it, a little bit of both like um i kind of started with i want a ranged i want a melee and i want a magic and i think that gave me like um the soldier the archer and the enchanter as like the three first ones and then i was like what well maybe i want to be ranged but i want to kind of get up close and i want to be a bit beefier and so that became the arbalist because um they're essentially crossbowmen that wear heavy armor, go right up into the thick of battle, and do less damage than archers can, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. But they do a lot of uh, essentially debuffs and enemy manipulation, so they can have special ammo types like grappling hooks, essentially. Um, and I've seen arbalists used to, quite frankly, frightening efficiency <laughs> in past campaigns. Um, uh there's the knight and he's just a big heavy dude but weirdly the knight regardless of archetype uses a mount and i really liked that idea that it isn't just heavier soldier it's like no he's a knight he has a mount and so um you have a choice between cataphract who takes the mount into battle and the dragoon who uses the uh mount to kind of flank and then dismount and then engage on foot um yeah um the weirdest one that the one that i find the weirdest and i want to try and flesh out a bit more is the priest um just because i feel as though it's never really been fully realized like i like it but i feel as though it needs a bit of work um essentially it's a charisma based class um where whereas in dnd gods uh, are like very very real like you can have a conversation with your god you can ascend to like godhood and all of that lark mm -hmm. um the priest in this is there, there's no there's no certainty that god exists almost like the um the concept of god in australia is the same as real life medieval if that makes sense like it is people's belief in god that has power not god um and so the priest can kind of have huge power when you're in a church or when you're in a town because people respect priests and in some cases fear them. But when you're going up like a big beastie in the forest or whatever, it, you're suddenly a lot less useful. Um, and I really quite like that because um, there have been times where the priest of the party has literally gone and hidden behind a tree but then when they made their way back into town, they got them out of loads of trouble or they achieved this massive uh, success by manipulating someone or just playing. I am a, I am a priest. You need to like respect me. Stop. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I like it as a concept, but I don't want players to be in a position where they have to hide behind a tree in combat. Um, and want to do a bit more work. And it's small things like that. Like I want to try and sort out with a few of the classes, I feel. Um, sorry, I'm scrolling through the uh, the player book as we kind of go along. Um, I like the ranger because he kind of bounces between uh, ranged and 
melee combat. Um, it was an interesting concept. I kind of bounced off of friends and everything. Um, yeah, the smith I quite like. Uh, soldier is just bog standard soldier man, but um, can be frighteningly uh, effective with other soldiers, which was something I did on purpose because I wanted um, essentially town guards to be soldiers. And so, um, oh god, where is it? Shield wall. Um, start from level two, you can, as a bonus action, form a shield wall granting you a defense bonus. Increase your AC by a number of allies adjacent to you equipped with a shield until the end of your next turn or you break formation. And so, if you have enough soldiers together, they can be almost unstoppable, like, almost invincible. <laughs> and, yeah, I, I like the classes I've got, um, but I feel as though I need to do a little bit more work on them balance them a little better perhaps fully realize the kind of ideas i have for them before i look to adding more um but the hope is certainly to add more classes and archetypes further down the road yeah um now when now since you since you mentioned crossbows something something that i'm a bit curious about is if you had if you um if you had plans on to make to make it so that there's going to be a trade-off between using a crossbow and using a, well, bow. Uh, do, 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 do. So, um, there kind of is, but it's not that great. <laughs> so, um, essentially, at the moment, if you are the crossbow mun, so like the arbalist mm -hmm. as a class, um, you have starting from fifth level, which is the quick loader, which is you ignore the loading property of any weapon with which you were proficient, which is primarily crossbows. Um, and so the idea is that anyone else using a crossbow over a bow will have the loading property. And so even if they have extra attack, they can only attack them once. Um, but the idea is then for the crossbowmen, if they have like this quick loader thing at fifth level, they can start getting off more shots. Um, however, they don't get it until fifth level, mm -hmm. um, which is when they also get extra attack, um, as do some of the other classes at fifth, I believe. Um, and so I've tried to have that kind of trade off. Um, the other thing is ultimately the archer with some of their abilities are capable of doing more damage than a crossbowman is. Um, and so I feel as though at the moment it's not necessarily balanced, but it's not a glaring glaring issue but it is something again that i'm looking to like go back to and readdress you may have noticed a lot of this is hanging together by like duct tape and a prayer <laughs> i need <laughs> i need to go back and like balance it or tweak that and tweak that but i have every confidence i'm going to be working on this for yeah. many many years to come with uh, as campaigns go on and i go oh i could change that or oh i could tweak that yeah um I will ad I will admit that part of the reason that came to mind was the was the art was the artwork for the crossbowman um using a uh, crank crossbow and I end up coming yeah. back to how reload re crossbows could certainly be powerful but reloading them was a royal pain. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. Um yeah, um all of the artwork I there's this great site called pixabay.com mm -hmm. um, and you can get like royalty free images that you don't have to provide accreditation for but um, I think I linked them on the front page somewhere I put down pixabay I believe yeah yeah um, and so you can just use them without any accreditation of royalties or anything like that and it's a really really great resource um, but it does mean that I'm quite limited in what I can find and use because I'm not an artist <laughs> um, I couldn't draw a stick man to save my life um and so i've tried to go with a fairly consistent theme throughout but sometimes it's a bit hit or miss um illustrating this book would very much be something i would like to do but i am i i know how hard artists work and how much you should value their work and i'm determined not to be one of those people that goes hey can you do this job and then offer what i think is a fair amount but that for them be a pittance and i don't want to take advantage of that kind of thing um and i wouldn't want to have the book illustrated or worked on in that way until i've got the rest of it kind of mm -hmm. in a place where i can do so um yeah 
yeah, I can def I can definitely I can definitely see that kind of thing. Um, the some something else I'm cu I'm curious if you're I'm curious if you plan on I uh, plan on addressing this given the whole low fantasy approach is the is the is the concept of other um pi other pillars of medieval style play whether it be um whether it be on the social end when dealing with say n the nobility and the like or um or thi or things like t things like say tournaments cuz every cuz everybody's got to everybody's got to have a jousting match at least once <laughs> <laughs> um i I'll start with the first point with the the social aspect. I've yeah. kind of tried to incorporate that as a mechanic. So um, with your upbringing, where you roll twice on that table to choose your two parents and their occupations, each occupation has what's called a social rank attached to it, um, which is the score that you roll on the dice to select it. Um, and you add those two scores together to establish your social rank score, um, which in turn establishes your social class and how much money you start the game with. And the idea is that it doesn't affect your opportunities in, um, I don't know, like it, it doesn't affect you in a purely mechanical sense. Like you're at no disadvantage fighting a bandit if you're from like the peasantry or if you're from royalty. Um, but the idea is that certain the DM can use your social class to try and influence how difficult certain social interactions will be. Um, equally, it may be more difficult to try and um speak to a member of the royalty or nobility if you're from the peasant class it may be just as difficult to get information from a peasant or you know some underground thug if you're from the nobility or really pompous and from the royalty um it's not a firm mechanic so it's not like oh you have disadvantage if you were trying to perform a i don't know persuasion check against someone two social classes higher than no it's just there to try and help inform the dm to make a decision um as far as tournaments and stuff go i really like that idea um i think that that would be that would make for a really really great like either one shot or short campaign that'd be h hilarious or even just like a longer form campaign going across to all of the cities to perform in all of the jousting tournaments um oh god what is that movie that i'm forgetting the name of has Heath Ledger in it? Ah, oh. um, A Knight's Tale. That's yeah. it. I, I can't believe I blanked on that. That's one of my favourites. It was like one of the first movies I got to stay up and late and watch with my dad as a kid. Like it was great. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, <laughs> but no. Um, yeah, certainly like that kind of vibe and like that kind of atmosphere of a campaign would be encouraged. Um, Again, I like giving people like the bullet points. So some people may want to take it in a really dark, really, um, well, dark way, like kind of Simba Room esque, um, like just blood, gore, death, darkness, <laughs> despair. Um, but some people could just be like, "Cool, we're going to Viewford. We're going to a, uh, we're going to a." Um, jousting tournament and we're going to have a jolly old time with it it's gonna yeah. be great <laughs> um yeah and i i think that's what i really like when you're given the bullet points rather than a firm set of instructions you can make what you want in that gray area so um i started one of my campaigns trying to be a little darker deliberately um they ended up beating a wyvern within an inch of its life and then <laughs> helping it get back to health and it eventually laid an egg and they kept the egg and now they have this wyvern in their headquarters that they call karen and she's the head of hr <laughs> um, and if anyone has a problem they tell them to go see karen and it's wonderfully bizarre <laughs> and yeah it's great the uh the with enough, with enough, t with enough time and planning, the odds that players will find a way to mess with a DM's carefully laid plans approaches one. Absolutely, like I, I like being that player, and I like it when players try to be that player. Um, my attitude is when I DM that I would always let you try something. It may not work out in your favor, but I will let you try and. 
they got a nat 20 when it came to like healing the wyvern up or something like that i was like well i guess you have a pet wyvern now great um Mm -hmm. and when it now when it comes to now um when it comes to the combat loop within within um within the game within Australia, given the fact that you're trying to go for a lo- a bit of a low fantasy approach, has there been consideration to changing the way, say, criticals work or something like that, if somebody wanted to introduce a bit more grit into their campaign? Um, at the moment, it directly follows D and D fifth ed. Mm-hmm. Um, that was quite a deliberate choice, especially when it came to combat, because I wanted to sell. I I literally sold this game to a lot of the people who helped play and test it at the pitch meeting for the gaming society at my university by going, "It's like fifth ed, but homebrewed." Um, and so, by keeping it a little closer to fifth ed, I could kind of fool them into playing it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I again like once it's kind of fleshed out, I am wanting to go through and start to change bits and bobs. Um, I'm trying to try to think. Like uh, I've, as I said, there's like that flanking mechanic, which is essentially if you imagine a um, a three by three square with the mo- with the enemy in the middle. If you are in the square to the left, all three squares to the right. If there's an enemy in it, if there's an ally in it, they get advantage. If the you have the monster's attention mm-hmm. um and similarly like corner opposite corner and the two squares adjacent um and it's just something that we homebrewed for the longest time i was like it's going in um and i'm sure that there are other small homebrews and ideas like that um like for me uh i don't know why but drinking a potion has always just been like a bonus action rather than a full action i don't even know if it is a full action in fifth ed core mm-hmm. um but it's just been the kind of thing like you can do that easily and fairly quickly you don't need a full action for it it's fine um, <laughs> i think it was uh people taking pity on me when i was first starting to play and being like why am i dead again um uh, but no uh yeah at the moment it does make use of the srd so mm-hmm. all of the main mechanics and everything from D and D fifth ed. I'm currently going through and trying to see if there's anything else I've put in. Um, I've got um, a few small rules for mounted. Um, no, I haven't. That was already in there. Uh, for the uh, magic of um, extracting mana, performing elven rituals, carving the dwarven runes, laying traps is a new mechanic also that I put in. Um, though I think it's fairly similar to the fifth ed way. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also this... Uh, weapons and armor work slightly differently, so certain types of armor have uh, essentially soak against certain types of damage. Um, so I think plate armor has like two points of soak against um, slashing damage or something like that. So if you were to take six points of slashing damage, if you're wearing your plate armor, you take four. And it's that simple, but I quite liked it because traditionally different pieces of armor are more effective against different types of attacks. Um, Like a chain shirt isn't really going to help you too much against bludgeoning damage kind of thing. Um, And so that was like a small thing that we introduced and quite liked. Um, There's also armor and weapon degradation. So um, if you get a nat 20 on your attack roll, um, you reduce the opponent's AC from armor by one, and it becomes damaged permanently until otherwise repaired. Um, But similarly, if an enemy gets a nat 20 against you, suddenly your AC has gone down a point, which is not great. Um, And... In a similar fashion, if you get a nat one when you're attacking an enemy, your damage, uh, your weapon becomes damaged mm-hmm. um, and takes a minus one penalty to both attack and damage rolls. I believe I may have to look that up, mm-hmm. but there is small things like that that I'm trying to put in um, where the way that combat works is still based off of D and D fifth ed core, but um, there are a lot of like smaller quirks about it and different homebrew rules that have kind of been introduced to um, perhaps change your thinking a little, but not so much that it's all of a sudden unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. 
and when um but and it's definitely something that I'll be look I'll be looking forward to see how it develops um especially since I'm pretty sure there's going to be some interesting bits of insanity in the com in the coming forms absolutely um, but with with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. Thank you for inviting me. I've had a wonderful time, and I can only apologize for always wandering off from what from the question and going down my own avenue of thought. Um, but it's been a lot do of fun. I, do I sound like me. a professional podcast to you? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, it's been great fun. Thank you for having yeah. me. My pleasure. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Thank you. Um, and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is, here at the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay... Fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>